crawl in here over a hundred times a day to get this install done. Ideally, this install should have taken place before we put in the rest of this garage apparatus for bikes and storage. But we couldn't get the system for months. So this is how I had to do it. I'd literally crawl in here, bring the components in, and mount them. If you remember, uh, I did the assembly of most of these components out on the table on a, a area that was sized out accordingly to this board that I'm mounting on. So when I brought all that in, it was just get it in here. Uh, the four odd cable is very heavy. The BMS is heavy. All of this stuff together, I had to bring it in, chalk it up, get it where I wanted it in this position and then screw it in. I torqued all of this stuff out there where it was easier to do so. By the way, uh, your vantage point right now, you're under the refrigerator. There's a laundry drawer that you pull out and this is what you see under there. You've got all this breathable room behind the scenes. The beauty of 80-20, no box construction. Just to your right is the Wabasto furnace. It's behind and under the fridge. It's easy to get to this stuff. <laughs> easy. This is Irene's dresser, okay? It's in and under the garage. Originally, we were gonna just have drawers mounted to the 80-20, but uh, we felt that uh, the clothes might get dusty being back here in the garage where the bikes and everything are. So we enclosed the dresser. We built a carcass and we put the drawers inside that carcass, that box. So it's sealed and it'll, the clothes will stay clean. Uh, but uh, originally, if we were able to take those drawers out, we'd have access right through this area to all this stuff. So we figured the amount of time that you're gonna need to come in here to work at this stuff very infrequently the, the clothes were the, uh, were the winner here. We wanted them to stay clean. If you have to get at any of this stuff, this particular bed panel right here, you peel the mattress back and you slide this panel over. The bed panel is made up in thirds. So we can slide this one away and it exposes all this stuff. Solar breaker, 12 volt DC loads, the BMS. I got a, a, a disconnect here. Uh, 350 amp fuse. So all of these, uh, these buses will get uh, covers. But as I said outside, everything is consistent. For instance, this is the 12 volt DC load on the lower post. This is the ground for that 12 volt DC on the lower post. Here is the positive coming off the BMS, second post down. Second post down on the ground, the negative of the BMS. So there's consistency. You'll know what you're doing when you get in here. And most everything is labeled. Speaking of labels, where do you see the gauges I got going out there? Beautiful. Let's go look. Uh, this, I'm black and blue. I got bruises and cuts everywhere from moving in and out of here, but I'm loving every minute of it. Let's go. We got the gauge panel in. Look at this. Look how beautiful this is. Alex did a nice job with this. He really did. Now, here's the thing about this gauge panel. You can see right here, we've got a piano hinge. A nice little 80-20 treatment. Uh, the piano hinge at the bottom you take out one screw at the top, which is a, mach a machine screw. It's not just a wood screw. You can take that in and out as many times as you want. We've got a, a threaded brass sleeve in there. So this panel hinges down and you have access to all the wires behind it. We left room to add gauges if need be. So that's in, that is beautiful. This is a water gauge for the fresh water tank. It's a 12 volt system. It's extremely accurate. It works on a magnetic lift system inside the water tank. If you want to just run in for a shower, you don't want to open up the bottom here to check the water level, just glance up here. This will always tell you where you're at. Now we got a game changer over here on the shower door. Wait till you see this. Game changer right here. 
Irene found this handle online. Flush, right? It says in the instructions that you gotta gout, uh, route out a half an inch depth. It's more than a half an inch. We were left with a sixteenth of an inch on three quarter inch plywood. It's okay. You just need to know that going in. Don't put this in a half inch panel. But look at this. I'm going to recommend this, this be on every door and every drawer in every van that I build. This makes the most sense for a van. Tight quarters. You're not catching your clothes on it. You're not impeding on the hallway. Game changer. Solar controller. This baby's going in next. This is a real sweetie. Okay, so here's the controller. Here's your mounting sides. What do we do? Most vans will have this solar controller mounted to a piece of plywood, most likely. Okay, and that's fine. They all do it. But uh, in the spirit of constantly trying to improve systems and taking baby steps and doing so. I look at the back of this solar controller. Could you see this? Do you see that heat sink? See all those ribs? That's a heat sink. You know what that means? You know what that tells me? This thing gets hot. So I will not be mounting it to a piece of plywood and let it slowly char said plywood. What I'm gonna do, as I said, I'm taking baby steps. Everything I do in the van, I say, what could I do to make this better? Each step of the way, baby steps. So, because the van has been framed out with 80-20, all my bones, my skeletal system is 80-20. It's a giant erector set. I got mounting points everywhere. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna mount the solar controller to a couple of flat stock aluminum bars. Then I can mount this onto my 8020. And where I'm mounting it, there's nothing behind it but the wheel well, airflow. Nothing but airflow. That's the name of the game when, it's, when you're talking about dissipating heat. That's what we're gonna do. Uh, a few of you have been asking me how I like the Makita saw for cutting metal as opposed to my uh, rigid, which is like a field construction saw. Not necessarily meant for metal, more general purpose. This saw is purpose built for cutting metal. Steel works very well in my case for aluminum. 15 and 5 eighths. The, um, the, the bed and the fence uh, and the clamping system allow for a much quicker setup and cut. Just slide this in place, throw the lock over, and it's ready to go. Now some of you would look at this and say, dude, why are you cutting this flat stock like this? Turn it, put it up against the fence so you got more clamping area, right? Well, that does make sense, and that's, that's intuitive, right? But here's the problem. This leading edge, as the saw blade comes down and engages this edge, you could chip a tooth off this blade. This is a 12 inch metal blade. It's a very expensive blade. Uh, the other part of that is you don't want to chip a tooth off and be anywhere near this thing. So you don't cut through where your first engagement is an edge of your stock. Turn it this way and you're coming down flat. Kabish. So right there. Lock it in place, throw it over. Half a turn, you're good to go. The other thing that I've come to learn is that for cutting aluminum, on the drill press, I use automatic transmission fluid. On this saw, I use WD-40. I put a little, dollop, little dab on each side, a little spot, and it works its way through. It makes for a nice cut. It keeps my, uh, my shavings heavy, and they drop. So that's it. I'm ready to go. One of the problems I have with the saw, uh, yes, I know, I forgot to put on my, my ears, but I generally do, but I'm filming here, so my mind is elsewhere. Um, one of the problems is I wish they would put a brake on the saw. 
because when I finish my cut and I release the trigger, I'd like a break to stop that blade quickly. The reason being the same deal. We are caring for the teeth of this blade. When you're pulling this saw back up out of the cut and it's still spinning, there's a chance it could catch the edge either side of the stock if it hadn't fallen down or it was here. If you catch that edge coming back out, you're going to blow a tooth as well. So it's a bit of a, a dangerous situation. You've got to be careful. This is, this is not a toy. The other thing I did that I find very, very helpful is uh, I added this, um, this fence. This is just a spare piece of 80-20 that I had. I put a, an elbow on it and I clamped it in place. I squared it off. And what this does now is that it gives me an extended support surface for my material. The other thing I do with this is if I need to cut several pieces the same exact length, I can clamp on what you would call a flag stop. This is really, uh, you know, this is, this is uh, shoemaker, right, to do it this way, but for me, it's quick, it's easy. Uh, uh, if I redevelop this system, I'll probably put in a sliding lock that you can get a handle from 8020, and I can slide that right up and down this channel and lock it where I want. But now, I can put in several pieces of stock and cut them all to the exact same length. That's very, very important in what I do. Now, they could be off by a 64th of an inch, but then they're all off 64th of an inch. So at least you maintain consistency down the line. You don't have them at all different sizes. You can't make a pencil mark on five pieces of stock you want to be cut the exact same. You'll never get it. You'll never get it. So this way, boom, cut, boom, cut, boom, cut. We're off to the races.